So how exactly does critical race theory harm the psychological well-being of a student, actually an adult, and anybody who comes into contact with its teachings? How, how does that work exactly? That's what I'm going to talk about today. I came across this fantastic piece from FIRE yesterday, and I'm going to put the link to it in the description box because I want you to read the whole thing. It's too long for me to read all of it. I am going to read a section of it because it speaks specifically to the way this kind of teaching impacts the mental health of the person on the receiving end of the teaching. Now, it really doesn't matter the age of the person, but it is a lot more damaging and a lot harder to deal with when you start young. I would go so far as to say, and I'm not a psychologist, so I'm just speaking as a mom and as someone who's had experience on the receiving end of treatment for things like this and with family members who've had to have treatment for things like this because of childhood exposure to these ideas, that it can take years. For some people, if they aren't able to find the right people to help them, it never happens. They never get help. So I've talked about that on this channel a lot. I want to focus on mental health. I am hoping someday to get somebody on the channel who's actually a psychologist to speak to it even more directly. But this article does such a great job of explaining the specific elements and thinking patterns that are a problem that I want to go into it. First, I want to explain that FIRE is an organization um, that is dedicated to preserving free speech in the academy. So they focus mostly on higher education, but I think increasingly they're focusing on K-12. And Greg Lukianoff, who is um, behind the organization, is also the co-author with Jonathan Haidt of The Coddling of the American Mind, which is a book I highly recommend. And what he's come up with here is a list of 10 principles for opposing thought reform in K-12. He calls it thought reform in general. And I think that's really good because... Um, referring to it explicitly as critical race theory has gotten us into trouble because in the K-12 classroom, they don't call it critical race theory. They call it diversity, equity, and inclusion. They call it equity lessons. They call it racial sensitivity training. They call it all kinds of things, but they never call it critical race theory. And that's, of course, intentional because it makes it a lot harder for parents and other people to criticize if they call it something like diversity, equity, and inclusion, because who doesn't want those things, right? Um, but they are, when you look at the lessons, when you look at things like the pyramid of hate and the oppression matrix and, you know, identity matrix documents and questionnaires, you do realize that it is critical race theory. It's whiteness studies. When kids are reading the anti-racist book from Dr. Kendi, when the teachers are told to read Robin D'Angelo's book, that's what it is. It's critical race theory. So he's calling it thought reform. And I think that's a pretty good way to talk about it. He also describes it as a form of moral education, which it also is. And I think even the proponents of it wouldn't deny that it is. They would say they're trying to change the morality of the students and they're trying to do it as early as possible. And the argument goes that if we get them early, then they will interrupt the process of them becoming a racist. But of course, the underlying premise is that they, they being white children, are born racist and they have to get in as quickly as possible to interfere with the process allegedly, you know, uh, inborn that will begin and keep going unchecked as long as their parents are the only people influencing them or as long as they're living with other white people and so forth. Then unless people who've been trained to root out the racism and, you know, raise their awareness and bring them to critical consciousness, they will just become racist, like full blown crisis. We're never really told exactly how that process works and what being a full-blown racist is going to look like, you know, it, on that theory, because there haven't been these people doing these trainings for however many years. Um, there's been racism since the Civil War, or since the Civil Rights Act. Uh, you would think that the whole country would just be, you know, right back to Jim Crow again, <laughs> because people haven't been interrupted by the critical theorists. But I digress. I think it's a good idea to call it what it is, which is 
moral training, moral education. It might wake more parents up to the idea that the teachers are taking over a role typically played by the parents and or their you know religious organization if they belong to one. Um, and it really shouldn't be done in the school. That's not to say that in K-12 there isn't some moral or ethical training. There always has been, there likely always will be, and there probably should be, but it shouldn't go this far into the personal. It used to be that it was, you know, be nice to people and don't take their stuff and don't hurt them. <laughs> you know, don't don't cheat, don't steal, just a, sort of a reaffirmation of the basic rules of polite society, not you know, you're, we presume to know your thoughts because of the color of your skin and your thoughts are bad and therefore we need to change your thoughts, including the thoughts you have about yourself. So that, that, that's going a little far. Um, but let's, uh, let's get into this, into the part I want to talk about, which is the mental health component. As I said, please go and read all of this because it is just so, so, so good. So we get down to principle um, well, let's go with principle number five. We'll start there because these are two things that really kind of go together. The first one keeps children in a state of perpetual childhood, and it's a state of childhood that is even younger than toddler in the sense that even toddlers, when they get into an argument, uh, can be encouraged and by, I think, decent parents are encouraged to resolve their own differences or work through it themselves rather than come running to mommy or daddy every time they have, you know, a disagreement with a sibling or a disagreement with a friend. Even if the parent comes alongside them and models how to talk to the friend about how their feelings were hurt or how something um, needs to be done differently, they don't just go running back to the friend alone as an adult and say, don't talk to my child this way. That's usually not what we do. We're trying to teach our kids skills. So let's talk about this. Foster independence, not moral dependency. Parents, educators, administrators, and employees in K-12 today are constantly given examples of the propriety of deferring to power and authority to stop interpersonal conflicts. This comes from a noble goal to, for example, reduce discrimination and bullying or promote tranquility. But it comes at a tremendous cost. Teaching young people that conflicts should be resolved by appeals to power whether that be their high school staff, their college's bias response team, or their company's human resources department, encourages habits of moral dependency and emotional immaturity, really. Because one sign of emotional maturity is that you can, in an in a assertive, non-confrontational way, defend your own boundaries. You know, maintain, set your boundaries, maintain your boundaries, defend your boundaries if they're crossed in a way that is appropriate to the setting and does not aggress against other people. That is one of the core skills of being an adult. Um, free societies must include some element of individual responsibility and encouragement to handle conflicts on one's own. It is hard to overstate the dangers of training a generation of people in a democratic society to always look to authority figures to resolve life's difficulties. This does not mean that K-12 faculty an administrator should never intervene, but it means they should not be too eager to intervene in interpersonal conflicts among students. The line between bullying and disputes among equals can sometimes be hard to see, but K-12 educators would once again do well to practice epistemic humility, realize that students are smart, and acknowledge that any system developed by authority to intercede in interpersonal conflicts will very quickly be gamed by highly socially intelligent students. To cultivate independence, resilience, and initiative, educators need to take off a student's metaphorical training wheels. What I've seen happen is I'm seeing people, when they talk about gaming, in our effort to prevent bullying and deal with bullying, we are creating bullies. Because by deferring to authority and not having people be responsible to resolve it amongst themselves, is far too easy to just go and accuse people of doing things they didn't actually do or exaggerate things they did do to make them much worse than than they actually were. So you can bring a hammer down on somebody you don't like. We are telling our students, we are to, whether they're in, in elementary school, high school, college, and beyond, we are telling people that you don't like the way someone acts and you think somebody should do something different. You go tattling to the next highest person and try to get them in trouble. It's what cancel culture is about. It is immature in the extreme and it's going to cause some pretty severe fights, possibly violence, if this is allowed to continue. Because you just, this is not how people interact with each other. I left there angrier than I ever would have been if it was just a matter of not being able to sit down. 
I was already kind of over it. <laughs> it's after she came out that I started getting really frustrated. So that's just something to think about. Let's let's not infantilize even our children. Like they're perfectly, I've seen four-year-olds resolve their differences on a playground better than I've seen 14-year-olds and now 40-year-olds. Okay, so we have um, principle six. Do not teach children to think in cognitive distortions. This is the mental health piece that's just explicit. My initial observations that led to the 2015 essay, The Coddling of the American Mind, was that we as a society seem to be teaching a generation of students the mental habits of anxious and depressed people. I mean, it's quite literally. Cognitive distortions are what people engage in when they are anxious and depressed. Now, coincidentally, learning to avoid cognitive distortions is also a good way to learn critical thinking. Indeed, some of the tools of cognitive behavioral therapy can just as easily be applied to the rules of productive debate between two people as to the habits of healthy thinking within one's own mind. When things happen to us, we explain them to ourselves, and we have a little debate within our own mind about what happened and why it happened. And the tragedy is when you stop even having the debate and you give yourself a story about what happened, and it's cognitively distorted and you leave it there. You don't even question what you, you're saying to yourself. And here are some of the things that you might be doing. Um, there's a full list he links to, but here are some of the ones that I've seen most often in this in these curriculum materials. Emotional reasoning, where we tell them, you know, your feelings are facts. So I feel really bad because of what something somebody did or said, therefore what they did was bad because of how I feel about it. Not necessarily true. Catastrophizing. So something bad happens and you don't look at it in terms of in perspective as to like what, how it looks relative to everything else going on in your life. And every setback, every letdown is a catastrophe to the point where you overreact about every single negative thing that happens in your life. It's all an existential threat. This is how you end up with things like words or violence and people being traumatized because somebody said something that disagreed with what they thought. Overgeneralizing. Well, all of critical race theory is overgeneralizing. Every white person is racist. White Whiteness is overgeneralizing. The concept of whiteness, the concept of black bodies and, you know, black experience and all these terms that are used that turn individual people into avatars for millions of people who may be no more alike than, you know, you or I, and, you know, it's just skin deep. So that's overgeneralizing. Dichotomous thinking, either or. It's this or that. It's this or that, always. And that's anti-racism or you're a racist. There's no in between. You either believe in this definition of racism, this definition of anti-racism, this definition of work, this definition of, you know, all these different things, character, et cetera, or you're all bad things. There's only two options, nothing in between. <laughs> There's no other choices. <laughs> Mind reading, microaggressions. I know what you meant. I know what you were talking about. You comment on my hair. That means that you're racist. No, I just think you have pretty hair. Nope. That means that you're observing my hair and you're looking at it because it's black, et cetera, so forth. That's mind reading. Deciding you know what someone's intentions were without even asking. Not a good habit to get into. Labeling. Start labeling people based on superficial characteristics rather than getting to know who they really are. So you begin to see people as not people. You're distorting their reality. You're distorting your own reality because you exist in the same reality as the other people as these other people. And if you mislabel somebody based on, you know, prior experiences or whatever, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking, you end up um, having more negative interactions than you otherwise would have. Negative filtering. Everything you see goes through a negative lens. Like, what's the negative way I can perceive this? Well, critical consciousness is literally teaching you to look for the racism in things. It's there in every interaction, they tell you. You just have to find it. So you're focusing on the negative. Most people will tell you that the the road to happiness is to focus on the positive, not in a Pollyanna kind of way, but you know, look for something positive to come out of even the most negative experience. If you possibly can, you'll get over it quicker at the very least. And there's something you can learn from it, even if it's patience, even if it's perseverance, resilience, resourcefulness. But to see every single that happens with 
how does this negatively or how does this negatively affect me? Now you have negative filtering and narcissism. Discounting positives. Yes. Well, the negatives matter so much more than the positives. Your intentions were good, but it doesn't matter because the outcome wasn't what I wanted it to be. Therefore, it's all bad. Blaming. Well, all of this is blaming. (laughs) And the worst part is it's blaming for things that may not have even happened to you. These are things that may have happened hundreds of years ago, but People are internalizing trauma that didn't even happen to them, blaming it on people who look like or have some superficial characteristics in common with the people who perpetrated the original insult or the original trauma on the other people who are no longer living in many cases. And so we get to keep the blame going as long as possible. The antidote to cognitive distortions is practiced disputation, which means examining and engaging with competing ideas in order to correct distortions and arrive at a nearer approximation to truth. Shielding students from competing ideas therefore does them no favors. That's just your white fragility talking. You're not you're not really and you know really anti-racist. You don't really believe in uh, um, what you're saying about not being racist. That's just, you just don't want to lose your power. What? <laughs> so if you're not even allowed to dispute what they're telling you and you're supposed and you're taught explicitly to not dispute it within yourself so that, that your first instinct somebody tells you you're racist based on the color of your skin is to say well that doesn't filter correctly that's that that doesn't match my experience that doesn't match my reality and then when you tell a child you know oh well that's just your fragility First, you're gaslighting them. You're denying their own experience. You're denying their own emotions. And you're interfering with their own process of disputation that goes on in their mind where they're saying, am I racist? No, I'm not a racist. And we need to have that voice in our minds. We need to be able to evaluate ourselves, our own behavior, the things that are happening to us, challenge those thoughts. Do they conform to reality or is it a distortion? If you shut that valve off, the distortions reign supreme. And you are literally living in a reality that doesn't exist. That's a tragedy. I've seen people who live there. They are very unhappy people. And it's a double whammy because their life in that realm is very unhappy because they're in a constant constant negative feedback loop in their own minds. But if they ever do manage somehow to, if something cracks open and gets in there and they start to realize how much time they wasted living in this land of distortion, the process of coming out of it is very, very painful. Now it's necessary and it's good because they come out on the other side, but it leaves them with lifelong feelings of regret that they then have to work on. So they have a whole other set of issues to work on when they're done because they have the regret, they have guilt of the things they said and did while they were living in that space. Um, They have guilt towards themselves, et cetera. It's very, very painful. Um, People who've gotten out of cults go through this. People who've escaped countries where they were brainwashed, like communist China or something, they go through this. It's very painful. The last thing we want to do is intentionally put our children in a position where if they're lucky enough to break free of this, they're going to have a painful transition back to reality. Um, Schools are tasked with instructing developing minds on the important disciplines of sound, careful, logical reasoning and should not allow or worse promote what our effectively logical fallacies, especially when they're about their own thoughts and feelings. And the last one um, I want to cover in this mental health trio is do not teach the three great untruths. In our book, Jonathan Haidt, and I also argue that it's as though we as a society are teaching a generation three manifestly bad overarching ideas, ideas that contradict both ancient wisdom and modern psychology. The untruth of fragility, what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. That every little thing that happens is just trauma, trauma, trauma. It's not. The untruth of emotional reasoning, always trust your feelings. Yep, we just talked about that. They're not always reliable. In fact, they're very often unreliable. That's where our, it's so ironic to me. We'll tell kids, you know, you have to check your biases and find your implicit bias. And then in the next breath, tell them, always trust your feelings. Well, your feelings very often are your biases. That, that's where they come out. That's where they're reflected. The, the best way to address potential implicit bias is to teach kids how to have that disputation process going on in their minds. Is this really true or am I using bias? Am I the, you know, to, to continue to do that, not just 
to punish themselves. Oh, you're a biased, terrible person. But just to say, you know, like maybe this emotion that I'm feeling right now is based on bias. Maybe this emotion isn't real. Maybe this, maybe this doesn't reflect accurately what's going on. Okay. So you're not always supposed to trust your feelings. The untruth of us versus them. Life is a battle between good and evil people. That's dichotomous thinking. And um, it's also um, stereotyping. So part of a lot of the the training and, and curriculum materials um, say in the, in the one breath, like your race is so important. You can't be colorblind because if you're colorblind, you are ra- you're racist. You're denying reality, all this. And then in the next breath, they'll say, don't stereotype people which is hilarious to me because that's exactly what they're doing is stereotyping people. So um, those are, my cat is trying to get in here. (laughs) Those are the ones um, I wanted to go through. The untruth of fragility leads us to avoid the challenges that lead to personal growth. And really the whole point, he managed to get in. The whole point of an education is to grow and expand our minds and become lifelong learners. And we can't do it, nor can we be mentally healthy if these things are explicitly taught to us. So there are lots of situations in life that cannot be avoided that can cause cognitive distortion, um, early childhood trauma of the unavoidable kind, death of a loved one, divorce in the family, any kind of abuse in the home, um, even abuse by a sibling. Things that happen outside of school can cause cognitive distortion in the child, we don't need to be explicitly teaching it to all the children or reinforcing any that might be developing outside of the school. So if your concern is, especially for kids who live in situations where there's a higher than average likelihood that they're going to have some kind of trauma in their life, you are doubling down on life's abuses when you teach them to look at the world this way. And it's causing all kinds of mental health problems in our kids. I mean, Teenage suicide is up, drug abuse, um, self-harm. It's it's just not okay to do this to kids. It does not help anything. You're helping no one. So um, I really wanted to drive that point home. I hope you will read the whole article. There is so much in there. It's what I've really been hoping for is that we'd come up a, a, with a list of what we want to say to schools what we want them to promise they're not going to do to our kids, leaving the politics out of it, even leaving the term critical race theory out of it, and just sticking to don't do these things. Don't teach my kid to think this way. Don't teach my kid to rely on authority to solve problems. Don't teach my kid that there's only good and bad and us and them and, and, you know, to trust their feelings all the time. And that if bad things happen, they're weaker for it. They're traumatized. They're victimized. Don't do that. Do not do that to my child. That's what we should be asking our schools, not asking, demanding that they promise us. And we want to see proof. And if they do it, we want them held accountable. So if you found this useful, I hope you will like, share, subscribe. And again, please go read the article. Thanks.